We are beginning the fifth high-level roundtable, the Brazilian 2018 Declaration of Judges on Water Judge Justice, now from the perspective of the judges themselves and those that are co-drafters of this um, uh, important document. In a previous panel, we had experts analyzing non-judges analyzing uh, the document. And now we are going to hear from uh, the, the judges themselves. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, the co-chairs of this panel. First, my colleague and dear friend, Justice Ranghil Noer from the Supreme Court of Norway. She is a very active member of our WCL Steering Committee, the Steering Committee of the World Commission on Environmental Law, and also a very active member of the European Forum of Judges for the Environment that is chaired by uh, our colleague, um, Justice Luc Lavrissen from the Constitutional Court of Belgium. She is highly respected globally and is one of the co-drafters of uh, the Brazilian Declaration of Judges on Water Justice and a founding member, a member of the executive governing committee of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. The other co-chair is also a dear friend and colleague, Justice Sapana Pradhan Mala from the Supreme Court of Nepal. She has a long history before joining the court as a public, public interest lawyer, filed many uh, important lawsuits protecting both the environment and women. And it has a strong leadership in the judiciary of Nepal and the region. She is a member of the steering committee of the World Commission on Environmental Law. Uh, well, it seems that we have some interference in Arabic in this channel. I don't know if it comes from the interpreters or from participants. The speakers are uh, Justice Nambita Dambuza, dear friend and colleague from the, the Supreme Court of Appeal of South Africa. She has spoken on the subject in many parts of the world and again, is an expert on environmental law and several other areas of law in South Africa. Justice Elisa Samuel from Mozambique, another good friend and colleague. She is the most energetic dean of Judicial Academy that I know. She is absolutely impressive, active, and participates in many international events. Our colleague, uh, Justice Millicent Odeni from the High Court of Kenya, the Supreme Court of Kenya, has just alerted us that she uh, has a family emergency a hospitalization of a daughter, and she's un, uh, un, unable to join us. And we are have some issues with justice, uh, technical issues with Justice Emmanuel Malki from the Cour de Cassation of Maroc. Uh, as I mentioned this morning, uh, Justice Emmanuel Ma El Malki is one of the co-drafters of the declaration and someone I admire very much from the Supreme Court, Coup de Cassation uh, of Morocco. So hopefully she'll be able to join uh, later in the program. So I, first of all, I will ask Justice Ranghil Nowhere for 
uh, her opening comments on the declaration uh, and the work that we did, uh, and also uh, opening uh, statement uh, from Justice Sapanam Mala. Justice Noe, please. Thank you very much, Antonio, and thank you for your nice uh, words, which are, as usual, a bit exaggerated when it comes to my participation. But it's an honor for me to uh, be able to participate uh, in this meeting and uh, to co-chair uh, about a very important subject, uh, the discussion about the Brazilian 2018 Declaration of Judges on Water Justice. As you might see from my background picture, I am currently, like maybe many of you, uh, on holiday. And yesterday I was on a mountaintop. Uh, I am not on a mountaintop now. Uh, and between uh, walking in the mountain, I read books. And the book I now have been reading and which has made a big impression on me is a book by Steven Pinker, which you might have heard about. It's called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he describes something in that book which is relevant for what we are discussing here. He describes how fundamentally the world has changed the last thousands of years from a situation where there was an kind of ever-present uh, state of brutality, ongoing bloody wars to the world today, which is, with some exceptions, of course, but overall, a far more peaceful world. And this shows kind of that the world, the humankind can go through very big changes uh, from one uh, uh, state of mind where brutality and war was everyday life to a situation today where for most of us, it's unthinkable. And climate change needs us to change fundamentally in the same way. The difference is that climate change is so, it, um, needs us to change so fast. And these changes that he describes has gone over hundreds of years. While we need to reduce emissions to zero uh, in just uh, 30 years. Will we manage? I don't know. It's really, really a challenge. But he also asks one question, why did these changes happen? And uh, the answer is, of course, complicated, but he points to two factors which is relevant for us in the work that we are doing. And the one is international cooperation that decreases the risk of war. And the other thing is functional, independent judiciaries which also reduces the risk of violence and wars. And that is kind of the positive thing that we are working exactly with these two things, uh, uh, which can prevent uh, violence and war. And, and my point here is that water scarcity, of course, has the potential to uh, induce in these kinds of violent uh, behavior between countries and beh behind people. So that was uh, some um, introductory remarks from my point. I'm really very much looking forward to hear from you, uh, your analysis about the Declaration of Water Justice and also in general about how the judges should approach these very, very difficult questions that we are uh, facing uh, in the light of climate change and its impact for water scarcity. 
I am afterwards going to introduce the first speaker, but uh, first I would uh, uh, like to give the floor or the uh, the word to uh, Justice Sapana Pradhan uh, Mala, who is also the co-chair of this session. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for introducing and allowing me to uh, speak a few words uh, in the opening ceremony. Um, when you talk about uh, what is justice, uh, we, we talk about the politics and a political relationship that shape human knowledge um, and intervention in the water world, which can lead to forms of governing nature, and it can also lead how social orders are maintained. Uh, connecting with the, the Brasilia Declaration, although, I mean, if you look at uh, um, uh, water justice issue, as already mentioned uh, by both the justices, that it is not only a national issue, it's, it's a transnational issue, it's an international issue. And uh, we have a limited uh, international uh, framework and understanding on this issue. I mean, although I mean, we have a many of us are party to social and cultural right covenant, and this covenant, um, 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 especially if we look at the 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 ICSCR, so general recommendation number uh, fifteen, it uh, um, calls uh, the 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 state parties if uh, any groups or individual. Uh, are denied with uh, uh, water justice, they should have uh, access to effective judicial uh, or other appropriate remedies, both at the national and international level. So we have that uh, accountability and uh, responsibility, and therefore it's key that uh, how judicial independence and competency um, you know, exist uh, in, 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 in the, in the um, judicial sector. Uh, so in this regard, uh, we have this uh, Brasilia Declaration, which not only um, um, promotes um, uh, different and 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 uh, creates understanding of judges on different uh, principles, uh, but also um, calls uh, national and international cooperation on uh, strengthening the competence of the judiciary. So in this regard, um, I'm very much uh, looking forward to hear from. Uh, the speaker in this forum and also look forward to Justice um, Antonio. Um, most importantly, um, uh, how, how these um, uh, declarations are applied and um, how, um, uh, what are, how, 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 how it has been executed at the domestic level or international level. And I also have a responsibility to introduce uh, one of the the, the speaker, uh, but now I would like to give a uh, floor to, um, uh, to our Justice Kanoir, and because she has to uh, introduce first uh, to the, the first speaker. The next or the first speaker is uh, Justice Nambita Dambusa. She is judge in the Supreme Court of Appeal in South Africa. There she has served the last six years. Before that, she served 11 years as judge in the High Court in the Eastern Cape province. And she was also then a court or, or a judge, uh, sorry, in the Competition Appeal Court. Justice Dambusa has also been, she has held an acting, acting stint at the Constitutional Court of South Africa for two court terms. She has had a number of other engagements and she is a visiting professor at the Rhodes University Law School in South Africa. With these words, I give the floor to Justice Nambita Dambusa. Thank you very much, um, Justice Noor. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, I was not present when the declaration was crafted in 2018. 
but I, I did find it to be quite a profound document that really brings us our focus as judges um, to issues that matter in the discharge of our duty in interpreting the environmental laws and applying them. Because in an ever-changing world, the scope and the role of judges can often be difficult to define with clarity so that they are able to discharge their duties maximally. And within the context of urgent increasing stresses on the integrity of the global environment, interpretation of legal principles and agreements and laws that are applicable within the various spheres of governance, uh, including local, regional, and international um, spheres, can be constrained for us judges by various considerations, including separation of powers and um, cultural considerations and independence of judiciaries generally as such and indiv independence of individual ju judges within um, the judiciaries of countries. On the other hand, judges do have the latitude and space, even though we do, that is within confined or um, delineated procedural and substantive guidelines to make decisions in the true interests of society rather than for political reasons. And judges are equipped with skills for listening, for learning, for analyzing and weighing up competing interests and interpreting and applying the relevant laws for the benefit of the society. But the reality is that oftentimes we are asked to decide cases within the context of issues that have been defined by the parties that bring these matters before us. So we do find ourselves constrained by the manner in which the issues that come before us are described or are set out. Nevertheless, the courts are entrusted with the role of protecting the environment and preventing or at least limiting further stresses or pressures on the environment and compelling reversal of damage to the environment. These are all the issues that the declaration speaks to. And given the interconnectedness and even the interdependence of the communities of the world, the role of the judges in un is uniquely crucial in bringing together the various cultures and jurisdiction so that the right to safe, um, clean, and sustainable waters is realized. Um, so against this background, um, the consistent building and enhancing of the capacity of judges and judiciaries within regions such as ours here in Africa, and internationally is crucial to enhancement of um, management of resources and ecosystems within the environmental sphere. With specific reference to water justice, I think there is widespread recognition or realization, or at least in paper of the right to access to adequate clean water. In a number of countries in the African continent, this right has become 
sheltered in, as a constitutional right. But even where that is not so, it is given prominence in numerous international declarations and agreement of which this is one. So our interpretation thereof and this declaration, which now becomes part of our arsenal to give effect to legal pronouncement, the laws of the environment is very important. And I think what it actually requires of us is consistent awareness when we determine issues that arise in water cases that we are not conducting business as usual. And that interpretation of these laws means life itself, communities. But we are learning as we go along that the interpretation of environmental laws and principles and all these agreements is sometimes an evolving exercise. In our jurisdiction, by way of in, in illustration, in 2009, and I think we were starting out in the interpretation of water laws within the constitutional um, context, since the right to access to water was um, provided for in our constitution in 2006. In the famous case of Mazibuko, the first interpretation of the rights, right of access to water by our constitutional court was that this right does not require that the state provides to every person upon demand and water, nor does it confer on citizens a right to claim sufficient water from the state immediately. There were various con considerations that were taken into account by the court and most of, most uppermost was the economic, economical ability of the state to be able to provide the right of access to water to everybody. But that judgment attracted considerable criticism. And later judgments have gone some way in ameliorating the potentially wide ranging effect of this judgment as against a right that is enshrined in the constitution. So in later cases where citizens have challenged, for example, disconnection of water for outstanding municipal utilities account, the courts have gone further than mere consideration of whether the common law requisites, the requirements for the spoliation order that these people were asking for. The court went further to consider the basic right of access to water supply and found that the discontinuation of water supply has to be fair and equitable. And mostly where internal dispute re resolution mechanisms are provided for, either in legislation or in government policy, they must first be um, exhausted prior to resorting to discontinuation of water. And I have seen that um, this is the approach uh, that is adopted, at least in Zimbabwe as well. In some of the cases, there is a, a judgment of Moshirwa in which the reasoning of the court um, followed the same line. 
Um, however, we still have not been able to define the right of access to water when it competes with other rights of access to water say, for commercial purposes where farmers are exercising water rights for the purposes of providing food to the public. The courts have just said that whatever those kinds of rights are, they may also not be um, they may also not, not be interfered with without um, providing um, the party's consent with opportunity to make right. Our judgments have to reflect our understanding of water as a public interest good. Although most cases of environmental law are presented to us as administrative law cases or constitutional law cases, there is room to be active in bringing to the fore the implication of the issues raised on related ecological and sustainability aspects of the remedies that, remedies that the parties seek. And generally, interdicts are the most effective and desirable remedy that one can give to prevent rather than remedy harm to the environment. That is not always possible. In the end, it is the judge's unfamiliarity with the implicated environmental issues that brings to life the attendant effects of the conduct raised on the integrity of our water resources. And so it is upon us to familiarize ourselves with what happens with our neighbors, neighbors and internationally within the sphere of water justice and access to water. We therefore have to work very hard at keeping pace with those developments domestically, regionally, and globally. There are always competing interests. For example, where customary rights and can raise issues of competing public interest claims. In cases where indigenous communities require access to water sources to perform cultural rights or access water resources for fishing, when on the other hand, we have to maintain sustainability of our water resources for the future. It is instances such as these where just and equitable orders are normally helpful and the approach that is also endorsed in the declaration of airing on the side that will be most beneficial to the environment. Again, we oftentimes, oftentimes by the time cases are brought to us, damage has been done. But through forward looking, educating and informed and informative judgments, we can promote prevention 
to future harm of our environmental resources, including water resources. And in a number of these cases, we have found that supervisory orders are an effective and a wide reaching remedy. But as sometimes happens, governance is not always an efficient, as efficient as it should be. In the government departments, it happens that due to high personnel, personnel turnover, and sometimes through sheer lack of interest, there is no continuity um, in policing environmental tra transgressions. In our case, you often see water running down the road, um, the dumping of waste on water resources that is that goes unpoliced. And um, a new phenomenon of because we are a water scarce country that continues to lose water, of selling water from public water resources that goes unpoliced. Again, it is in places like these that supervisory orders um, have been the most effective um, tool that we have been able to use. These are not easy matters to navigate. And the coming of together of judges in forums such as this one to rekindle comments and share new ideas and discuss. I believe we lost the connection uh, with Justice uh, Dambuza. Um, in any event, I think I was coming towards the end that these are not always easy matters to navigate. And the coming together of judges in forums like these um, assist in rekindling these commitments and to share new ideas and discuss our challenges to enhance, enhance the enforcement and application of the environmental laws so that we may deepen our environmental justice and the service that we render to the communities of our countries. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Justice Kudembuza, for sharing your, your ideas on how we judges can make difference uh, not only on what justice, but environmental justice, enhancing our own understanding. Um, uh, thank you for your thoughtful presentation. Now, I would like to introduce uh, the second speaker, and I'm very pleased to introduce today uh, Judge Elisa Samuel. Um, she's at present director for the Center for Legal and Judicial Training of Mozambique. Uh, as a director, she's also a uh, member of Advisory Council of Ministry of Justice, as well as um, uh, Judge Elisa is also a secretary of Mozambican Judges Association. Um, she has been part of many active organization. Uh, before this, um, uh, her, her, her previous role was uh, in Judiciary of Mozambique as a judge president of Judicial District Court of Bileni, Makia, and Makava in Maputo Provincial Court. Uh, she is also former member of Judicial Commission and its permanent commission. And she, she was also part of the commission in charge to draft the regulation for the appointment of judges. And uh, Judge Elisa, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Justice uh, Pana. Uh, I hope you are all um, listening very well. 
Uh, I would like also, first of all, to congratulate uh, the organizers of this important uh, uh, Congress. I also to congratulate uh, IUCN uh, for this, I mean, to thank uh, IUCN and especially uh, Justice Antonio Benjamin uh, for inviting me to be uh, to be part of this Congress. It's a great honor for me to be here and to learn more about environmental law uh, in, in Africa and also in the world. Uh, my presentation will be, uh, of course, uh, into this Brazilian declaration on, on water justice. Uh, the question of my presentation will be what it means for water justice and governance in Mozambique. Uh, actually, I will be analyzing these two principles, the principle eight and seven of the Brazilian declaration. Uh, but before I do this, I would like also to congratulate my panelist colleague, uh, Justice Dambuza. We always share the panel, so it's a, it's a very <laughs> great honor to be here with you as well. We are neighbors, but because of COVID, we cannot be together, unfortunately. Um, well, uh, I will start to say, saying that uh, the Brasilia declaration, Brasilia declaration of Judges on Water Justice, it was adopted, as we all are aware, at the 8th World Water Forum in Brasilia on March 21, 2018. I was not there as well, but I have learned uh, to know about this declaration as a judge and also as a de deputy, uh, as a judicial uh, training uh, uh, center uh, tra trainer. Uh, this declaration recognizes that water justice involves environmental stewardship, intergenerational equity, sustainable ecological system, uh, customary rights, the prevention and precautionary principles, uh, the indubio pro natura principle, the internalization of external environmental costs, including the polluter pays and the user pays principle, good governance, uh, holistic uh, approach involving, uh, let's say, um, integration of environmental factors and procedural water justice. In this uh, comment, I will be examining the water pollution and pol polluter pace and the user space principle and water justice and governance principle uh, by illustrating uh, examples of Mozambican legal framework so far approved and in cases where the declaration principles were upheld by the courts and also uh, by the environmental authorities in Mozambique. Uh, for, for this intent, I will, I will be speaking about water pollution uh, and doing so, I will use the definition that will be, will, will be given by the World Health Organization, uh, defining uh, water pollution uh, has when its composition or state is so altered that it no longer meets the necessary conditions, which are physical, chemical, and biological properties for uses for which it was intended in its natural state. So uh, as we are all aware, water pollution indicates that one or more of its uses have been harmed, which can affect many, uh, I mean, men directly. Water is used for drinking, for bathing, for washing clothes and utensils, for making food and drinking domestic animals. Uh, it is also used in industries and in the in irrigation of plant or of plantations. Uh, I'm 
I'm, I elected this uh, water pollution because the most common problem in Mozambique in relation to surface water resources and mineralization that manifests itself through salinity and electrical conductivity, which registers higher values in international rivers. Water pollution caused by mining activities is also an environmental problem in Mozambique. The pumping of mineralized water out of the mine into surface water results in the pollution of these waters as various toxic products are used in the mineral treatment process. So the carrying out of mining activities also ca causes significant impacts on inland, surface or underground waters as a result of the release of large amounts of waste, some of which are extremely toxic. Uh, the impact caused, for example, by the gold mining activity along uh, surface water resources or courses in the province of Manica, Sofala, and Miasa here in Mozambique are serious and have caused damages given the use of mercurio has, uh, I, 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 I've learned to, to uh, to understand by the reports that have been released in various studies also in Mozambique. Uh, let me just um, uh, highlight this, uh, that in terms of water resources, Mozambique has 13 main hydrographic basins from south to north. The Maputo Basin, Umbelusi, Incomati, Limpopo, and the most important one, among the most important ones, we do have this Rovuma ri River Basin, which is the north in Mozambique, in Cap de Legado, where uh, this uh, oil and gas uh, uh, mega project has been taking place and is already uh, a part of uh, 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 the pollution that has been causing also the terrorism in the north uh, of Mozambique and also the desertification and uh, uh, the displacement of people, of local communities. Uh, so this is a, a, a very uh, problem, a, a very uh, big problem now that we are facing as a country. But um, Mozambique is also a downstream country, sharing nine of 15 international rivers basins in the SADC regions. So um, it also a vulnerable to disasters caused by climate irregularities. In recent years, the country has frequently experienced droughts, droughts floods, and cyclones causing a negative impact on social and economic development. Uh, the recent disasters where Idai and Kenneth also happened in the, on, uh, with, in the center and north of Mozambique most recently. Uh, so uh, Mozambique's challenge in managing and developing water resources to meet the goal of the plan of action for the reduction of absolute poverty and sustainable development goal six include clean water and sanitation, water for food security and rural development, prevention of water pollution and ecosystem conservation, disaster mitigation and risks management, management of transboundary water resources and benefit sharing. Our constitution recognized the right to water under its right to life, which is guaranteed in our uh, constitution by Article 14 and promotes at the same time the right to environment and quality life by Article 117. And the other laws and policies also recognize the right to water as an essential constitu constituent of the right of life. So the courts also upheld the right to water 
as an essential constituent of the right to life. Here comes the importance of the Brasilia Declaration. And I would, in the next minutes, sharing with you what the judges uh, have been doing, have been doing uh, 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 in terms of integrate the principles enshrined in the declare in Brasilia Declaration. The principle eight of the Brasilia Declaration promotes good governance of water laws. It provides that consistent with the proper role of an independent judiciary in upholding and enforcing of the rule of law and ensuring transparency, accountability, and integrity in governance, implementation, and enforcement are essential for the protection, conservation, and sustainable use of water resources and related ecosystems. So the, this, the principle of good government is essential to sustainable development of water resources and related ecosystems. It requires the enactment, implementation, and enforcement of clear and effective laws that support the conservation and wise uh, use of water resources and related ecosystems. So uh, in terms of Mo Mozambique has enacted a very uh, good and strong legislation uh, to protect uh, 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 the right to enjoy the water uh, 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 resources and the clean water uh, uh, resources. So um, let me just give some examples. Um, uh, in Mozambique, in sentencing for water pollution offenses, uh, courts and also mineral resources authorities applied penalties for two mining companies for fail to undertake the necessary measures to prevent pollution of waters. The first case, it's so-called uh, uh, Inspector General of Ministry of Mineral Resources Authority versus Clean Tech Mining Company and James Resources. Uh, in this case, these two companies operating in Manica, central Mozambique, were suspended for polluting rivers that support agriculture and livestock exploitation. The industrial mining companies, Clean Tech Mining, uh, company and gems resources in question were, were suspended from office and fined in in excess of 100 min, minimum wage the equivalent of let's say about 10,000 euros for being repeat offenders in water pollution rivers through the deposition of pollution in the course of the rivers in the case, the government institutions informed that these operators are artisanal miners and they are aware about the proper techniques in order to avoid pollution, but they do not use them. So they, the, the, the attorney general, uh, along with the natural resources authorities and police that we have in Mozambique, they start this process and they end up uh, um, finding these uh, two companies because of the pollution of water. So this is how uh, uh, the Brazilian declaration also uh, help us to understand uh, the importance of the implementation and eff effectiveness of laws and regulations uh, about environmental uh, uh, and also water resources uh, uh, in in our countries. The second case, it is a stud. Uh, what the stud was was conducted by the non-governmental organization, so-called Sekelekani, uh, released in the city of Tet, uh, in the center of Mozambique. Um, this stud. Uh, scientifically analyzed the social and environmental impact of coal mining activities in the region 
of Moatiz uh, and Benga, uh, covered by mining companies uh, Vale Mozambique. This is a, a Brazilian enterprise, but is also represented in Mozambique. Uh, the study results point to profound changes in water and air quality. Regarding hair quality, the study says that the suspended particulate, particulate detected include sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide and dioxide, and nitrogen oxide. The document also assesses the level of noise pollution. And in this case, Brazilian mining company Val Mozambique said that it's it's been developing in Moatiz a series of social and, and environmental activities resulting from its uh, environmental management plan. Uh, they also highlighted that the monitoring of meteorological conditions, hair qualities, noise and vibration, water quality and influence were in place. But the the what ends up is that the Land and Environmental Authority rejected that plea by considering that Val Mozambique has failed and however to address the fact that it's also bound by the environmental protection regime. So uh, according with Mozambique, Mozambican law, it is required by law to do what is necessary to protect the environment. That's what this uh, uh, Land and Environmental Authority said. And also uh, the Attorney General uh, have started a case around this problem. Um, so in order to, up to uphold water justice and governance, uh, the legal community in each country needs some form of guidelines to help them navigate the complex a set of issues that surrounds water issues. And this is where uh, I think Brasilia declaration comes in. Uh, I will not be uh, talking about the, 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 British, the Brazilian declaration itself, but uh, I would now switch to the second part of my presentation as a director of the Judicial Training Institute, as Justice Dambuza has said, uh, these uh, water justice uh, um, e uh, issues are complex uh, uh, subjects. And in our uh, Judicial Training Institute, we've been uh, dealing with uh, uh, the environmental law and also uh, with the, the way of strengthening the capacity of judges and prosecutors and magistrates in order to deliver in terms of uh, water justice and environmental uh, concern uh, as a whole. So uh, in 2018, the judiciaries in Africa, recalling also the 2016 World Declaration of Environmental Rule of Law adopted in Rio de Janeiro, and also the 2018 Declaration for Judges on Water Justice adopted in Maputo, the so-called Maputo Declaration on Greening Judiciaries in Africa, where they declare the commitment to strengthen and retain the necessary capacity in judicial institutions to adequately adjudicate environmental disputes. I would like to thank to uh, to thank the uh, UNEP uh, 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 from um, Elizabeth uh, Marula. I know she's here. Maruma. I know she's here, and also my friend Robert, because they were they help us to organize this this meeting in Maputo, uh, where we we had uh, twenty five chief justices from Africa and almost 42 uh, heads of the judicial training uh, uh, schools uh, in Africa. So this was the, the big event that ended up with this declaration. And according with the declaration, 
uh, the judicial education institutions were encouraged to develop within two years env environmental law training programs for judges, magistrates, and prosecutors, taking into account, but not limited to, uh, broad areas, uh, principal subject areas of environmental adjudication, including environmental, wildlife, and forest crimes, human rights, and environment, and environment, and also has uh, the, term, the, the, the term of my presentation, pollution, governance of fresh water resources, governance of marine and coastal resources, and governance of mineral and other extractive resources. So Mozambique, as part of this declaration as well, uh, we've been de developing this manual and curriculum, which is being tested for initial and continuous training of judges and prosecutors. What I'm saying is that we are, in, in fact, implementing this, the, 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 this manual and curricula uh, in terms of environmental law in Africa, and also helping to strengthen the judiciaries, the capacity to deal with the environmental issues in Africa, but in particular also with the uh, um, governance of freshwater resources and other uh, environmental uh, 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 rights. So I'm, I will stop here my presentation by thanking you all uh, to be so patient and listen to me speaking in my broke English. But thank you anyway. I beg to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the presentations, both of you. I don't think that El Malki from Morocco is uh, able to, to join us. So I think uh, these are the two. Unfortunately not. Uh, but I told her that she can join at any time uh, she uh, is able to. She's facing some, some difficulties. Uh, so what I, uh, I suggest is that we get a few questions from uh, the audience in, uh, in Rabat, uh, and then we can wrap up and move uh, to the award ceremony. And I'll ask our colleague, uh, Eman Shekawi, uh, to coordinate the questions, if there are questions from the audience. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Ministro Antonio. Donc, uh, nous allons uh, faire un petit tour uh, d'horizon uh, pour voir s'il y a des réactions ou des questions. Donc, uh, je regarde autour de la table. Et j'aimerais aussi uh, uh, rendre hommage à la présence uh, parmi nous de Monsieur Cher Touré, qui est donc uh, coordinateur régional pour l'Afrique au sein de la Convention des Nations Unies pour la lutte contre la désertification. Uh, Monsieur Cher Touré, si vous avez uh, quelques commentaires à faire, vous préférez réserver à ce stade pour plus tard. Très bien. Euh, des questions Oui, je vous en prie, professeur. Merci beaucoup, euh, cher Ayman. Et je suis honoré d'être présent aujourd'hui à, à ce congrès très intéressant. J'ai appris beaucoup de choses et donc, en fait, par les interventions donc vraiment euh, pertinentes euh, et puis les discussions aussi euh, très intéressantes. Donc, euh, je voudrais, euh, euh, comment dire, juste rapidement... Donc, rendre hommage à une, à une session de ce matin euh, qui a vu, enfin, on a vu la présentation de deux personnes très pertinentes, Madagas une, une, une professeure euh, Saouli de Madagascar et le professeur Ibrahim Mali. Malheureusement, donc, on n'a pas eu donc, de discussion sur, à ce niveau-là. Et euh, permettez-moi de dire que ce sont des, deux interventions pertinentes et euh, Notamment, donc en fait, Madame Saouli a soulevé la question donc de l'importance des droits coutumiers et donc en fait et des savoirs traditionnels. Je je vous invite donc à ne pas négliger ces aspects-là qui sont très importants. Maintenant, donc je viens à cette session très pertinente aussi et des interventions vraiment euh, très importantes. Et euh, merci beaucoup et félicitations à tous les intervenants 
pour ces aspects-là. Alors, euh, le cas du Mozambique, euh, présenté dernièrement, donc fait par euh, professeur, euh, euh, pardon, excusez-moi, donc en fait, euh, est, est, est très pertinent. Je voudrais juste poser la question à madame. Donc, euh, le, dans le principe de, euh, pollu de pollueur-payeur, euh, il me semble, donc en fin de compte, que payer une amende n'est pas suffisante, notamment quand il s'agit de pollution, enfin de, de dégradation euh, donc, euh, minière, donc, euh, suite à une exploitation minière, dégradation des sols. Est-ce que donc, euh, la loi euh, exige aussi ou a prévu la restauration des sols après exploitation Merci beaucoup et. Voilà. Merci beaucoup, professeur. Je vois encore deux questions. Donc, il y a M. Benis ainsi que Mme euh, Imen Omar qui vont intervenir. Donc, si Benis, je Je crois que nous avons eu droit à deux présentations très pertinentes, très intéressantes euh, sur l'Afrique du, du Sud et également de la, du Mozambique. Je... De l'Afrique du Sud. Je vous demandais, est-ce que euh, les politiques publiques, bon, enfin, je crois que dans, dans beaucoup de pays, nous avons des études d'impact de l'environnement sur des projets. Quelqu'un qui veut réaliser un projet, il y a des études d'impact. Je crois que c'est assez, c'est relativement généralisé. Mais pour les politiques publiques, Lorsqu'il y a un projet qui est réalisé par, des, par les politiques publiques, je, je prends l'aéroport, je prends l'autoroute, etc., est-ce que ces politiques publiques sont soumises à des études d'impact de l'environnement ou du moins des études d'impact stratégique afin qu'il n'y ait pas cette distorsion entre les politiques publiques qui doivent donner l'exemple et le privé qui est soumis à une obligation d'études d'impact euh, par rapport à la pollution de, de, de l'eau, moi je crois que c'est quelque chose d'extrêmement de, important, la gestion de, de, de la pollution entre pays frontaliers. Et je crois que hier on a entendu, je répète encore ça, que la gestion de, du voisinage peut être quelque chose de très, très important. Même on a parlé de, de, de bombes, de conflits, etc. Je voudrais savoir, est-ce qu'à partir de votre expérience, il y a maintenant un modèle qu'on peut proposer pour gérer les politiques de, de pollution aussi bien de la nappe que de l'air entre les pays voisins Est-ce qu'il y a un projet, quelque chose de réussi, ou bien comment on peut améliorer ou instaurer un processus et de l'améliorer de façon euh, progressive. Je sais que c'est difficile d'être de commencer par quelque chose de parfait, mais je pense quand même qu'il faut commencer même de façon imparfaite et améliorer au fur et à mesure. Voilà, je vous remercie beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, euh, Madame Imen Armal. Euh, vous m'entendez bien donc, ça fait un immense honneur d'être là parmi vous. Je voudrais juste souligner quelques points que, comme vous savez, que le Maroc occupe une position leader à l'échelle du continent africain et comme à l'échelle du monde arabe en matière de protection de l'environnement et gestion des ressources naturelles, que ce soit les eaux superficielles ou bien les eaux souterraines. Ceci est bien illustré par le renforcement du arsenal juridique dans plusieurs secteurs, que ce soit la gestion des déchets, notamment la loi numéro 2800, la loi d'études d'impact 1209 et aussi la loi sur l'eau. Le, de surcroît, le Maroc a bien participé activement dans le plusieurs initiatives et programmes à la protection d'environnement. Et euh, maintenant, on a, en matière de gestion des ressources en eau, euh, le Maroc s'ouvre sur d'autres alternatives et perspectives justement pour l'approvisionnement en eau potable. Notamment, euh, on a le, 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 la perspective de dessalement des eaux de mer, les eaux saumâtres et aussi la réutilisation des eaux usées et aussi le, la valorisation des eaux de pluie. Euh, sauf que, cependant, il existe des lacunes au niveau de la loi, euh, notamment la loi 36.15, c'est que certes, nous avons des points sur, par rapport à l'utilisation de ces eaux, mais il y a euh, des lacunes de point de vue des valeurs limites de rejet. Si on procède aux unités euh, de dessalement, euh, il n'y a pas des valeurs limites par rapport à les, les formules, le brine management, 
Certes, que ces effluents-là, ils ont un impact nocif sur la, la biodiversité marine et aussi par rapport quel est le devenir des eaux usées par rapport d'autres industries, notamment les unités de trituration des olives, les industries de raffinerie, etc. Et de ce fait, on revient à la question, c'est la, la sagesse légale. Autrement dit, il faut renforcer les compétences des juges et les encourager pour coopérer avec les scientifiques, les experts du domaine, de collaborer pour avoir une approche cohérente entre eux. Cependant, si cette texte législatif ne peut être euh, concrète et ne peut être euh, visualisée sur, ter sur terrain, sans avoir aussi procédé à la vulgarisation juridique. Autrement dit, il faut justement impliquer les citoyens et euh, simplifier ces lois-là pour procéder à l'application et favoriser la participation des citoyens aux décisions. Par rapport au cas de Mozambique, ils ont dit qu'au euh, euh, Mozambique, il y a de la pollution par rapport aux métaux lourds. Est-ce qu'il existe des... Euh, quand on parle du principe pollueur-payeur, ben justement, on se référencie aussi par rapport aux limites de rejet. Est-ce qu'il y a des seuils limites par rapport au cadmium, les cyanures, etc., pour pouvoir distinguer cette pollution et aussi limiter ces rejets avant de les déverser dans le milieu récepteur Donc, je vous remercie autrefois. C'est nous qui vous remercions pour votre passion et la pertinence de vos questions. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres Oui, je vous en prie, Sidi, de la Merci. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Au nom des bureaux de l'AFAO à Rabat, je voudrais vous remercier, remercier la Fondation Mohamed VI et son Centre international de formation sur l'environnement de l'invitation qui lui a été adressée justement pour participer à ce congrès, congrès qui, est, qui a traité d'une thématique aussi importante et aussi stratégique. En fait, c'est une thématique qui constitue pour l'AFAO de grands défis, des défis à l'échelle planétaire, des défis à l'échelle de, de la région euh, de l'Afrique du Nord, des défis au niveau de la région du Maghreb et également euh, du Maroc. Alors, euh, je pense et je peux vous le confirmer qu'il ne passe pas un jour où il n'y a pas justement une thématique ou un séminaire qui se traite au niveau de l'AFO concernant justement cette thématique de l'eau la désertification, ou même en ce qui concerne justement l'aspect des lois. Je vous le confirme, il n'y a pas un seul jour où on n'est pas en train de traiter cet aspect-là. Alors, pour le cas euh, du Maroc, euh, la représentation euh, de la FAO, c'est un témoin que je suis en train de, en fait, d'apporter et non pas, si vous voulez, une question. Euh, il a un pôle qui traite la question de l'eau. Et la pôle qui traite la question de l'eau, et puis justement avec toutes ces indépendances, toutes ces interactions qui existent en ce qui concerne l'eau, la désertification, ou justement la question de la réglementation. Alors, je viens de participer justement à ce congrès qui est pour moi, il est riche d'informations, et qui pour moi, il constitue un genre déjà de benchmark. Au niveau du Maroc, l'approche Nexus est en train de faire son chemin. Et on est en train justement déjà de la traiter avec au niveau de certains bassins hydrauliques. On a commencé par le bassin de Benimillel, le bassin de, de, de Marbi et le bassin de, de, de Soussmessa. On est en train peut-être aussi d'aller vers le bassin de Mlouya. Et ça, donc, c'est quelque chose qu'on vient de voir aujourd'hui et qui constitue comme une approche qui a toute cette, son importance avec ces interdépendances, comme on vient de le voir. Il y a aussi justement des contributions à la mise en place des contrats de nappe. Et là, on a commencé avec certains, certains exemples au niveau, par exemple, de Brachit. Et c'est justement ça, là, c'est toute la complexité. La gestion, de, la gestion si vous voulez, des utilisations, et toutes les interdépendances et les lois, justement, qui régissent et les règles qui régissent justement, cette utilisation et ces ressources. Au niveau, du, au niveau un deuxième exemple, même plutôt, disons, pas un problème, mais un grand projet qui vise la revitalisation des agroécosystèmes moisiens et, et qui se base sur trois créneaux, l'eau, la biodiversité et le sol. Et ça, on vient de le voir justement dans ce congrès, on les a traités tous les trois, d'une manière ou d'une autre.
Et là, justement, la question de l'eau, elle est traitée par différents aspects. D'abord, la comptabilité de l'eau, pour connaître quelles sont les ressources et quelles sont les utilisations. Deuxième chose, c'est que, en quelque sorte, on verra vers la question de l'application et du respect de la réglementation en ce qui concerne l'eau. Troisième axe, c'est la maîtrise des eaux superficielles et la, la recharge des nappes. Ça, c'est un problème également. Et puis, justement, les facteurs de pollution, que ce soit, si vous voulez, liquide ou, ou, ou solide. Et puis, justement, la mise à la disposition de l'eau aux divers utilisateurs, que ce soit l'eau potable ou pour la délégation. Ça, justement, je vous ai apporté ce, si vous voulez, ce témoignage pour dire aujourd'hui est une grande thématique très importante pour notre, pour notre pays, le Maroc, mais également ça montre, si vous voulez, toutes les interactions et les interdépendances qui existent au niveau, si vous voulez, de cette question. Je vous remercie beaucoup de nous avoir justement invités à ce congrès et qui vraiment nous a enrichi de pas mal d'informations que nous allons pouvoir mettre à profit au niveau justement des programmes de la FA. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Sidi. Et c'est également ce que nous reconnectons avec nos coprésidents de séance afin que nous puissions entendre les réactions de nos éminents experts et juges. Merci beaucoup. OK, thank you. Um, I hope I have understood this question right of whether there are any public impact studies uh, that have been done. I, there, there are numerous. Um, there are numerous, but most of them are done by uh, public uh, private partnership groups and private uh, NGOs and, and other interest groups. Um, we, our main um, legal frame and environmental legal framework is managed through um, the um, National Management, National Environmental Management Act that was passed in 1998. And just briefly, for, for, for the purposes of this discussion, the The most important aspects thereof are the environmental impact assessment requirements that are, are enforced very strictly. Um, since it, it took a while for it to take off, but it, it has taken off and um, it, it, it is yielding really huge, huge results um, to the extent that various many big contracts that our government had committed to um, had to be stopped because of that. Um, I think one, some of you might be aware of the, we were trying to, the, the Russians had, um, I think about six years ago, offered to build us nuclear, more, more nuclear stations uh, because of our power problems. And as you know, we, I think we rank amongst the highest, if not the highest coal users um, for our energy. That's where we derive our main source. The drive for renewable energy is big. And that contract that ran into many, many billions was stopped because of um, impact assessments that were um, uh, conducted. Uh, by, by, by interest groups that brought the matters to court. Um, the, just about a month ago as well, another uh, coal power station that was mooted was stopped for the very same reason. And about a month ago, uh, we were, we, we, we were negotiating contracts with I think some Polish companies that were going to bring power ships and dock them near Cape Town. That th these are called power ships that were going to be used to reinforce our electricity. But the environmental, th that, that deal, which also ran into million, billions of rain, 
and was going to be un, um, that was going to be um, executed over a period of 20 years was stopped because of um, the environmental impact assessment uh, requisites that were not meant, met. So uh, we've got many other fewer ones. Um, so I, I, I don't know whether that, that's the kind of response that uh, the case question wa was directed to. And even um, in relation to water, you, you might also be aware that we, again, because of our large uh, mining, um, long mining history, um, we have a huge um, asset mining drainage uh, 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 difficulties. Um, from the recent past going forward, uh, we, there is active implementation and application of the laws that are applied. But the, the damage that stems from um, years, decades, and perhaps even a century ago, still linger on, um, especially with the gold mine dumps that are just outside Johannesburg. Our difficulties now is going backwards to say, to apply the polluter pay principles on for, for companies that were um, that that po whose whose pollution still haunts us today. Um, there are political considerations and all that goes with it, but we haven't been able to call back the people that messed up the environment from time from some time ago. Um, but currently. Uh, the, the, the environmental assessments are the left, right, and center. We do do quite a bit of that. And um, there is even at the stage a movement. Um, it, it has actually been implemented, implemented where agreements are concluded with by communities together with their local governments and provincial governments in terms of which <laughs> we get the government get um, what do you call snitches? What do you, um, people who tell on people who waste uh, water or pollute water? And I think this is a beginning of another, a, a, a movement that, that may yield huge results for our environmental protection. I often compare it to our AIDS, HIV movement because we managed to combat that because of bottom down, bottom up approach rather than top down, which is what we have been doing all along. When you involve the communities, but we have the legacy that our communities for historical reasons did not own uh, or identify with their environments because they would be shipped from uh, as migrant laborers from one part of the country to the other. So a culture of uh, not non-attachment to your environment developed. And that's what we are still um, sitting with today that um, communities um, need they, we need to have a, a huge mass movement of getting communities to 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 identify the, the, their spaces as they are, so that um, they, um, they, they they can help them be involved in the management of their environment. Um, what did I miss? Um, I'm I'm not sure. You let me know if I've missed something. I don't want to talk forever. <laughs> Uh, that's just uh, Elisa. I mean, if you can be a br briefly respond to some of the questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I discovered late, later that I was not using the translation, so I'm not quite fluent in French. But um, uh, when I catch when I catch up, I, I understand more or less what was. What was the question? Some, some are the, they are questions, but another one's a comment. So uh, I will, 
I will join my 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 response to uh, Justice Dambuza response uh, by adding that we also in Mozambique we do have in place these laws regu regulations and also policies about the impact in, uh, assessment environmental assessment they've been doing but the thing is differently from South Africa and Mozambique we we the exploitation of natural resources it's um it's very recent and it's also very recent all the, the laws and regulations and policies and procedures if you want me to see, allow me to say but i think the the big question the, the, the big problem is not whether we do have these old regulations in place is the way the the, the these regulations and this uh, uh, legal framework 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 is being uh, is being implemented there is something very big which is a problem all around the world which is corruption those those uh, 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 companies that they conduct this uh, uh, impact assessment and also whether they are from government or a private sector uh, it's the problem is their lack of information within let's say the, the whole community the society and we are not aware about the the really impact that is gonna have this exploitation yeah and this is the big problem i think it, that that there where uh, the judiciary comes it, it comes in because we have to really be a uh, control controlling all these procedures the the prosecutors must be in all steps of this impact assessment because we they, they always say that the the impact assessment has been has, has been has been done and the report is here but the question is we are understanding what they are saying that is correct or not or they have been fair on uh, publishing the results so i think the importance uh, that we we must think of is also that there is a, 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 this uh, corrupt corrupt corruption and the way that the reports are doing the way that the these companies they've been choose to be to to conduct this kind of of, of impact assessment so I, I will say I will stop from here. I, thought, I don't think I do have other um, questions that have been ad addressed to to my presentation, but I will be happy to answer it if uh, someone can can remind me where uh, what what is the question. Thank you, Justice Espa Sapana. Thank you, just, uh, just uh, Elisa. Uh, just to continue, if you want to make uh, yes. any observation, I, but uh, you also have to keep in mind you have, we have a award ceremony. Yeah, thank you so much. In fact, um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, the two co-chairs. As you could see, they are both outstanding. And also the two uh, speakers uh, that are also outstanding. Uh, and you probably didn't, um, uh, you, you also notice the message. This is a panel in which we have two Supreme Court Justice um, women, and we have two uh, justice, uh, one justice and one judge, and at least as soon we will be a justice at the Supreme Court of Mozambique. Uh, we, we can see that happening. Uh, they uh, also two women. And it's no accident. Uh, this has to do with uh, the importance of inclusion of women in the judiciary. This applies to Africa, applies to my country, applies to the whole world including Scandinavian. So uh, the other thing that I would like to mention is that the Brazilian Declaration 
of judges on water justice is not international law, but it's more important for us judges than if it were international law, because it's part of the judicial wisdom or legal wisdom that uh, it reflects this, uh, uh, this judicial and legal wisdom. And no wonder that immediately after we approved the declaration, it began being cited by Supreme Courts around the world. The first one was um, the High Court, the State Supreme Court um, of Mumbai. Then we had Pakistan, the Supreme Court of Pakistan, my own court, uh, the Supreme Court of Argentina. So can you imagine uh, a convention that is ratified and is cited in less than six months by we, the judges. So here, it's a common vocabulary, it's common wisdom, and that's the beauty of this whole uh, declaration that I do hope we have more time in other opportunities to discuss it.